Hey all, uh, today we're going to talk about the T-cell circuit. So the T-cell circuit is housed on the safety PCB, HV enclosure board, whatever you want to call it. That is a printed circuit board that is housed in the HV enclosure, HV hump, as you want to call it. So overall it resides in the space above the cells. So real quick, you'll notice that you've got this part over here. It's like a rectangular box that essentially houses all the actual cells that make up our accumulator or battery. Um, the term accumulator is an FSAE term uh, that is used to generalize your energy storage system. So usually this is a battery, but they use the term accumulator because you are allowed to use other energy storage forms such as supercapacitors. So calling it a battery to generalize would be technically not correct, but in our case, it's just a battery. So the, ba uh, the T-cell circuit is what we're talking about. It's housed on the board, HV enclosure board, and that in turn is inside this enclosure. It's a 10 by 10, 10 centimeter by 10 centimeter uh, PCB. That's the s size that we try to cap all of our printed circuit boards at at a maximum because anything larger than 10 by 10 the price from almost any PCB manufacturer goes up a lot so try to keep our boards small it also encourages good design practices so you're not just wasting space because you think you have it um, right okay so now we're talking about the T cell what does T cell stand for there are a lot of acronyms. I'll try to break them all down. Um, for example, you can see where I've highlighted over here. T-cell stands for Attractive System Active Light. It's an acronym right there. Um, the purpose of the T-cell is to indicate to people around the vehicle what general state it's in. So what are the two main states that the car can be in? Just like your normal car, it's either on or off, but there are a few more nuances to it. Overall, you have the low voltage side and the high voltage side. These two are completely separate systems. Well, they're electrically separate, meaning you've got no crossover between the HV and LV systems. They don't share a ground. There are no shared connections. Everything on PCB, at all. if a PCB, such as the HV enclosure board, houses both low voltage and high voltage circuits, there's a minimum separation distance that is required by rules. And we have to meet all of those, you know, in order to pass tech. Now, the HV system um, is something that is turned on after the low voltage system. So first you'd turn a master switch, turn on the low voltage, and then you would go through a process to make sure there are no existing faults and close what is called the shutdown circuit, often abbreviated as SDC. And once all of your conditions are met, you know, all the checks that the car, that you're able to do and the car is able to do, that there's no issues with the HV system, um, then you go ahead and turn on the HV system. So when you have essentially three states, you have off, low, low voltage and high voltage off, low voltage on and high voltage on. So when we're in the off state, there you probably won't see anything lit up on the car. No, no noises, nothing. When the low voltage system is on, as per rules, you need to have a green LED that is at the top of your roll hoop. Um, I will update this and include a picture with that shows that so the you'll notice on the car you see two, uh, like one big hoop uh, that's called the roll hoop just in case your car ends up upside down or something like that that roll hoop will take most of the force instead of the driver's head who without it would be sticking up won't be won't be great if you flipped and the first thing to make contact with the ground is your head right anyways these lights are located at the top of the roll hoop which is the highest point of the car and should be visible from basically all like 360 degrees. So 
when the car's low voltage system is on and the high voltage system is off, we want the LED to shine green, a solid green light that's visible all around. This indicates that the tractive system or high voltage system is off, but the car itself is on. Generally, I would call this like, you know, like uh, everything is safe to touch. The high voltage system is safe to touch. You should still check all voltages with the multimeter um, before actually touching anything or messing with anything. And ideally, the entire car should be off. But the a good way to think about the high voltage system is the same way you think about gun safety, where you always treat it like it's loaded. Um, and, okay, so low voltage on, high voltage off, solid green light. Now, what we want our circuit to do is when our high voltage system is on, we want it to be blinking red. Now, the rules state that this blinking red light needs to be a certain frequency. I think it's two, between 2 and 5 hertz. Um, but that's the general gist of it. When your low voltage system is on, HV off, solid green light. And when both systems are on and you're essentially in a ready to drive, you can put your foot down, the car would go, then you're blinking red. So how do we achieve this? Well, that is done with this circuit right here and this part. So let us talk about how that happens. Cool. So let's just go over one thing real quick. Um, another rules related facet is that your attractive system is considered energized when the bus voltage is 60 volts, 60 volts DC or greater, or 25 volts AC. Now, gener uh, generally, and this is how it works, uh, our battery generates a DC current, which is then c converted to three-phase AC by our inverter or motor controller, which then provides that three-phase AC current to our motor. And then that's how it goes. So when our, our battery feeds our inverter, along with multiple other power electronics, uh, just name a few, we've got the T-cell board, we've got the DC-DC converter, um, and anything else that we might need. So what do we need to do? Uh, we need to detect when our bus voltage reaches 60 volts, and then we need to switch over to uh, from the green green solid LED to the red blinking LED. Cool. So we've got our goals of this circuit in mind. We know what we want it to do. Now we need to set about making that work. So, ah, here are the rules. Okay. Um, these are the rules that I were referencing, where you have to they specify the color that the red must be flashing, the green rem remain continuously illuminated. Um, so it indicates the GLV system status as well as the HV status. You cannot do this with a microcontroller. It says software control is not permitted. So this limits your design options to hardware only. And it has to be a dedicated circuit. So you can't like use the functions of the circuit to drive something else. It has to only drive these LEDs. Um, they specify the location rules, the physical rules. So if you are designing the circuit, you'll need to talk to someone on the mechanical design team. Uh, and they'll probably help you place that and integrate that into the master. And they also do, uh, specify that your T-cell has to be visible, you know, basically from everywhere and in direct sunlight. So you can't use any weak sauce LEDs over here. Um, cool. So that's just going over what I was talking about before for the past however many minutes. Now, 60 DVC, cool. So we're looking at this circuit, which was carried over to, from 2019, though the current pictures and screenshots in the OneNote are the versions that have been made for 2020. These may be subject to change uh, next year, but for right now, this is what we're working with. All right, so let's start from, by going from left to right. Like, that makes sense, right? You start from over here, 
and then we travel through here and then we go down here and over here and boom TSA out TSA in TSA in how about that sound good good roadmap all right now starting with the T cell HV sense section generating a uh, we'll, we'll look at the legs real quick so briefly we've got our HV plus and minus input we've got our IC5 which is actually a linear regulator that takes this input and produces a stable 5 volt signal we've got IC1 which is an op amp and I think that sums up most of the active components in this um, in this like area so let's talk about this got the HV plus input from from the uh, bus bars so we'll have the accumulator running uh, the main lines from the cells to accumulator isolation relays AIRs thick boys um, and then those will output to a bus bar and then from there we'll draw from that for all these different circuits and stuff so supplied to the board uh, 150 milliamp fuse and from there let's talk about this linear regulator so we got a linear regulator with a max input of 40 volt 450 volts 40 volts 450 volts now our maximum attractive system voltage based on our 2020 battery is sits somewhere a little bit above 400 volts so that's within spec uh, max output current of 10 milliamps that is, believe it or not, enough to cover all the stuff in here. Uh, yeah, yeah, basically. Cool, so linear regulator. We've obviously got our VN right here coming off the HV plus, and we've got our ground, which is uh, HV minus. That's our reference for all, HV minus is the ground reference for all of our high voltage circuits. You don't use the chassis ground with the low voltage. So if you ever see anything that high voltage that references the chassis ground, other than maybe like the IMD, then something is very wrong. And you should talk to whoever designed that. So got VN, we've got ground, and we've got the second ground. All right, over here. Makes sense. And V out. Cool. Um right okay now what where do we go from here all right so we got the basic inputs and outputs of the linear regulator should make sense I don't think there's anything too complicated there real quick let's talk about these capacitors what are they for capacitors are these ones in specific are you would call them decoupling capacitors so let's take a visit you might be asking oh what is a decoupling capacitor um, let's take a look at the data sheet. I'll pull that up real quick. Now, linear regulator, wide input voltage range. All right, cool, that's what we want. And 10 milliamp output, right? Oh, shoot, wait, there's this. All right, I was on the data sheet, but let's take a look at what a decoupling capacitor is real quick. And there's this great article from Eagle. I don't know what this pop-up is doing here. There we go. Okay. So decoupling capacitors. This website is real, uh, or not this website. Obviously, it's from Autodesk. But uh, this quick little article is really good for explaining uh, decoupling capacitors. And as you can see, it's very, very short. Um, basically, they are used to stabilize input and output voltages, as you can see. Oh. We have a capacitor at the input, right? And we've also got a capacitor at the output. Now, this capacitor over here is used to, uh, both of them are used to basically stabilize the input and output voltages. And they, by, by doing that, they, they filter out the AC noise. So whenever you have a signal, you'll generally have your DC level and then your extra AC stuff, so these will block it out so your output will just be straight. There are a lot of times where you want that. And this is one of them. So they filter out noise, 
and they stabilize the output. So like if you think about it, if your output's wiggling a little bit, then what this capacitor will do is when it wiggles down, it'll you when it okay, so when it wiggles up, it'll store that excess energy because you're trying to, you know, get the average. So it'll store that excess energy or excess charge. And when it wiggles down, it'll release that excess charge so that whatever's on the other side of that capacitor will have a more even output. Now that makes sense, right? You want your if you're if you're creating a DC level, you want it to be you know solid. Now you might be your second question might be, okay, cool. I know that we need uh, you know decoupling capacitors, but how did you know where to place them, and how did you know what values to use? Okay, so placing end values are taken care of by what? Um, the data sheet. So I've linked to the data sheet right here. So it's a link to this where they actually mention on the very first page, they give you two typical applications. Now, I'm gonna let you answer this real quick. Which one of these uh, reference, like typical applications, reference schematics, would we wanna use for this linear regulator? Right, now that you figured that out, we'll go back to here. And I did the lib I took the liberty of snipping, uh, taking screenshots from the data sheet and including them in the OneNote. So we've got the important pins V in, two grounds, and V out. And look, they tell you connect a 2.2 microfarad capacitor from V in to ground and connect a 22 microfarad or larger MLCC, multilayer ceramic cap, I think. Multilayer ceramic, it's definitely a ceramic. Uh, capacitor from V out to ground. So they say, oh, cool. Uh, they tell you what to do. They tell you what capacitor values to use. And they even show you in the schematic exactly how to connect it. It's so sick. Now, let's see how this lines up with our schematic, right? Okay, we've got V in, we're over here, by the way. We've got V in right there and got V into ground, 2.2 microfarad. Yep, checks out. And then we've got V out and V out to ground. Also checks out. And that one is 22 microfarad, 22 microfarad. Cool. That is what those capacitors are for and how they were selected. What is next, you may ask? Well, what is next is read through this section. Where is it found? It's found at the near the bottom of the data sheet. They give you application information. Always re, like at least skim through the entire data sheet because there's useful information that you could miss if you just go in looking for one thing, find it, and head out. Um, they tell you about the input and output decoupling. Layout recommendations for decoupling capacitors are pretty general. Just put them as close to your pin on your integrated circuit as possible. And it's important to consider the thermal section too. This is probably overlooked a lot of times, but what happens is it tells you if you if your if your circuit is drawing close to that 10 milliamps that the um, regulator can provide, then uh, they're saying the um, the temperature will go up, and as the temperature goes up, it affects the operation of the chip. So you need to consider uh, thermal relief. Uh, you might be thinking, okay, but you know, what, is, what if I don't, you know, it's extra work. Well, what happens is some really scary stuff. So this is an indicator of whether the tractor system is on. It's powered directly off the HV, HV uh, you know, the HV outputs and let me tell you, uh, we ran into this problem that I document down here where it was not, there was not an adequate thermal solution. And so when we turned the HV system on, this chip heated up and it got pretty hot. And that red light that's blinking started blinking faster and faster. Now you can imagine how that'd be really scary. And you imagine having to deal with that um, considering that competition is closer to summer where the heat goes up. So you, you'll even have to consider, even if you're testing in February, the ambient temperature could be enough 
to, you know, change how this thing works. All right. So now we move on to the next part of the circuit. We figured out everything to do with the regulator and its respective decoupling capacitors. Now what? Now we are going to talk about the operational amplifier as well as these voltage divider or resistor dividers, whatever you want to call them. Um, ideally, you would want to use a more like appropriate symbol than just a box, even though that's what they've done here. It's not that hard to figure out considering you have op amp out, op amp in, and you can kind of tell by the uh, pin names. Anyways, let's take a look at this op amp. Um, in case you haven't taken 205 yet, I think that's when they really, really go into op amps. Um, we are using this, an op amp is short for operational amplifier. Um, it is usually supplied as an integrated circuit uh, that's comprised of various transistors. Uh, so if you think about a MOSFET or a BJT, this is more complicated than that, but you probably use it just as often. And there are many uses for it. Uh, one of the typical uses is for voltage gain. So, you know, boosting voltage on the output. But another very common use for it is in digital circuits um, where you can use it as a comparator. So that's what we will be doing here. Um, I think this uh, picture right here sums it up pretty well. So if you, but I will explain a few things. The source of this picture can be found at the link I have right under it to this electronics tutorials page. Really, really good. They start very, very basic um, and give you a very, very good idea of what op amps are. So, real quick, um, plus VCC and minus VCC pictured over here are the supply voltages or rail voltages. So those are data sheet dependent um, and those are Supplying those voltages are necessary because that's how you actually power the chip. Without that, your op amp won't function as you want it because it's like, it's a powered device. It's not like a resistor or a capacitor. Those are passive. This is an active device. So uh, you get your plus VCC, minus VCC, and you've got an out, all right? So think about, you've got two inputs to your comparator, and then you've got an output that depends on the inputs. So let's take a look at this box right here, which tells you exactly how it works. You've got VN and VREF. If VN is greater than VREF, then your output goes high. If VN is less than VREF, then your output goes low. And they also tell you implicitly, in, explicitly, in this box that your high and low logic levels are determined by plus and minus VCC, which you re remember are your rail voltages. So those are your logic levels. So let's keep moving. Uh, we've got our op amp here. Our output goes to the next part of the circuit. So, and our inputs, let's look at our inputs. Oh, right. So inputs are in minus and in plus and V minus and V plus represent the rail voltages as you can find in the data sheet. Well, I haven't included the data sheet link here, but if you take this model number and Google that, then you can find it. You'll probably find a DigiKey page which will have a link to the data sheet. So let's look at our rail voltages real quick. Got pin five over here. And if you remember what's the output of this linear regulator, Five volts, correct. So our rail voltages is five. Are five volts. Now, most of the times, so the way that you describe the comparator is, you know, when one condition is met, it swings to your rail volt positive rail voltage, and when the other condition is met, it swings towards your negative rail voltage. So this will go between zero and five volts. Um, and let's see, a V minus, yep, HV minus. So that'll be our reference. And now all we have to do is look at the inputs and outputs. And that's where these resistors come into play. All right, let's talk about them. 
Um, let us talk about them in D. So let us start on the left side because that's a little bit easier to determine. So what, what, do we, what we have here is a voltage divider. What's the purpose of a voltage divider? It's to take an input voltage and step it down to a lower output voltage. Um, it's the fundamental of it. You might think that does a similar, it performs a similar action to linear regulators, which you'll remember also did the same thing, and DC-DC converters, which are another type of voltage converting device. Um, but voltage dividers are usually not used to make a steady like output signal that other things can reference to or to like power changing loads um, because the behavior depends on the load as well as you can see with this picture over here. Boom. I stole this from the internet. Link is... I'll have to include a link. I have to include that link because uh, we're doing proper referencing here. So I think this explains pretty well what a voltage divider does. Um, you can take a look at these equations. They're pretty basic equations. You will learn them in 205 and you'll get very familiar with them. But you've got one for the V out, which is lower than V in. It's basically, in a nutshell, the ratio um, between R2 over R1 plus R2. So if you do the if you do the calculations, you can derive this pretty easily. There's a, there are plenty of tutorial videos on YouTube um, if you want to know where this comes from. But uh, yeah, so basically the output voltage is determined by these two resistor values. All right. So for example, you know what your um sorry. You know what your input voltage is, you know what your minimum, maximum input voltage is, and you know what your output voltage is too. So you can design your circuit, choose your resistor ratios, and then go and choose the actual values. Now, I thought it was really helpful um, that from 2019, we have this document over here. You've got the, it's called the T-cell design doc. I have linked to it in the OneNote. You saw me click on it right there. So let's take a look here real quick. So which one are we looking at? We're looking over here that uh, this, this little paragraph section de describes this part of the circuit with these two, with R2 and R4. Um, so looking, let's see. Our voltage regulator max input is 450 volts, so assume that's the maximum voltage. Op amp supply is 5 volts, so op amp inputs. Okay, so what they're saying is remember how we said the VCC determines the swing of you know your output? Well, your VCC also determines the range of inputs, so you, because we have 0, 5. You can only input, your inputs also have to be between 0 and 5 volts. So what, is that, what does that tell us? Well, if our V in, V plus over here, is coming from this side, and our V minus, or in, in what the hell? Okay, so our in minus is coming from this side, that's the reference, and our in plus is the measuring side. Um, then our in plus and in minus, what are their maximum values? Five volts. So we have to make sure that the max output of this voltage divider is five volts. That is exactly what they're saying here. The supply is five volts, therefore the inputs should never exceed five volts. Now they do a little bit of you know quick dividing. Five divided by 450, that's the scale down, right? Uh, because if we look here, your input is maximum, we're assuming 450 volts, so you need to scale that input in order to produce five volts right here, maximum. Makes sense, right? Cool. So, um, now that we have our, uh, our ratio, we, so stepping to this equation over here, we've got our 
we've got our V out, and we also know what our V1 is, right? 4, 15, and 5. So now that leaves us on the other side of the equation with R2 over R1 plus R2, and, <coughs> excuse me, doing some algebra, um, we've determined that the um, that this is the ratio we need to use, 989 to 11. Uh, so you're like, all right, cool. That's the ratio that we need to use. Let's keep boogieing. Um, but we're not done yet. Go way back in your memory. And remember, we don't want our reference. Like, we don't want to be measuring when our tractor system hits 450 volts. We want to know when it crosses over 60 volts, right? So now we would need to treat our input as 60 volts, but we still want to step it down the right amount. So here, think about this. Your maximum input is still five volts. So if your system, if we charge up our, our, our high voltage system all the way from zero to 400 volts, then our maximum still has to be set like this divider still has to be calibrated for that 400 volts. But you can still use that same ratio to, to determine the output for um, 60 volts, right? Because we'll go from zero, hit 60, and keep going. So what we can do is you can just multiply 60 by that, um, you can just multiply 60 by that ratio that we have. And so this gives you the voltage, right? Because if you think about the simple, simple algebra, you, now you're trying to figure out V out. So you have V1, which is now 60. So you just, and you have your ratio that you figured out from your previous. So now you got your V out. Easy peasy, lemon squeezy. Um, cool. So now that we've determined our, um, we've determined that the op reference input to the op amp should be 0.66 volts. So, so uh, once you get, uh, you know your, let's say we're working with 450 volts, right? 450 to 5 volts. Then once you know your V out over V1, that's a number, is equal to R2 over R1 plus R2, you can determine uh, using a little bit of algebra what that ratio is going to be. Meaning you can get like a R, R, R1 over R2 equals some fraction, right? So. That fraction that we get to um, produces roughly, uh, as you can, we can skip the math, look at the final selection, 931 kilo ohms over 10K. So you might be thinking, all right, cool, that's what they found, but, but our ratio is, if our net ratio is 931 to 10, how do you know if that's 9.31K to, 100 or something like that. I can't do math. Forgive me. Uh, not, yeah. So what you'll want to look at then um, is now you got to choose exactly what values. Normally you're working with like powers of 10. So um, if you want, you can do some, you need, okay. So when actually selecting your resistor values, you can keep the same ratio with different resistor values. That's the point. Um, most of the time you learn about this in 205, I don't think they really uh, go into selecting different ones. So 931 and 10 ohm resistor versus a 931K and 10K ohm resistor. So, um, quick rundown. Uh, you need to look at the current um, consumed by your resistors because you know the resistive values you lose you, you lose some uh, that's how resistors work they dissipate some power um, so you got to look at how much uh, power is consumed and how much current uh, you know that you're in our case The current consumed by the resistor matters. In a lot of cases, um, it does matter. When you get really, really low, like a 931 and 10 ohm, 
you're talking like you'll need some you'll need some pretty um some pretty chunky resistors for example down here you'll need let's say um if you're using a super low resistance you're gonna end up having to dissipate a lot of power and that's when you would need something like a chunky like big resistor which if we're putting on a pcb we don't want that um current consumption very important additionally <clears throat> We can figure this out by making a model. So I encourage you to do this in PSpice or using or in some CAD program that and use PSpice to simulate a circuit, especially one as simple as this. It's not going to be hundred percent accurate, but it'll give you a great um, baseline to work off of. Um, you could probably I don't think Altium has uh, Spice built in, so you might want to check out something like ORCAD. Um, that'll, that'll help you do it. You'll probably use ORCAD depending on who your professor is, uh, in your later classes. But, um, you're looking at these divider values, right? Oh yeah, the circuit. So I use 60 volts, really doesn't matter. You can use 450, same sort of deal. But this is the volt value that we care about, so it might be useful to compare apples to apples. Um, right, so what I did was keeping the same ratio, I made the divider circuit. You can see I stole this from the circuit we're simulating with load. Now, what about this 2 mega ohm resistance? So the other thing about op amps is that their inputs, you treat the load as like your input resistance for your op amp, which are usually in, in your classes, you'll treat them as infinite, but ideally, like in real life, they probably won't be infinite. I actually wasn't sure what a good value would be to use, so I just chose two mega ohms. Kind of picked it out of my ass, but you know, we'll work with it. Anyways, two mega ohm load, you can imagine, won't have a huge effect on our circuit. Um, as R2 gets bigger and bigger, it'll become more of a deal, but right now, you're not going to get much current going through that two mega ohm resistor. So, no big deal, should work out just fine. Um, I circled green and green to, you know, show you the corresponding resistors in their actual circuit. And now what I did was I put, you know, used circuit lab because I'm lazy, um, and made a table. So I changed out R1 and R2 and like incremented both of them at the same time by, you know, powers of 10. And I came up with this table to compare all the output values. So you can see that, um, you can think of this table as going down in resistance, even though, I mean, it looks like that, but sometimes it can be a little harder to tell. Um, note the units. So we're going, we're starting with our 931K and 10K, and we're going all the way to 930 ohms and 10 ohms. So um, look at the output voltages. You'll see that as we get lower and lower resistances, the output voltage kind of trends towards one value. So you can, in a sense, you can say it's getting more and more accurate. But you can see our output current starts out really low and gets higher and higher and higher until we hit like something like 63 milliamps, which doesn't sound like a lot, but it kind of is. Um, yeah, not good, not good. So uh, basically that's your trade-off when you're making a voltage divider and selecting resistor values. This smaller resistor values give you, I think, more accurate uh, output voltage, but um, they also consume a lot more current. So depending on your circuit, if it's battery powered or something like that, a lot of current might not be a good idea. You need to consider how much accuracy you need and how much current you can draw. In our case, um, it doesn't, our accuracy isn't actually too important. Um, so we will go with uh, the highest value, the one that, that draws the least amount of current. Cause that's more important to us than you know, a few millivolt differences. Um, and I'll have you think about this later. So, um, yeah, um, that's, that's sort of how you go about selecting a resistor values for a divider for, you know, sensing. Dividers are usually used for like s feedback in a lot of cases or like sensing inputs because you can have, you can be a little bit loosey goosey with them. All right. So I, what I talked about is basically described in this section over here. There is a great, great, great 
forum post where someone goes into detail and this is really good for understanding all this. They have links to circuits where you can just hover your mouse and you can't see it, it's cut off in the corner here, but it shows you the, the values of where your, where your mouse is. So it basically saves you the trouble of putting everything in um, some schematic or some, some piece by using program and it does it for you. So, um, yeah, so that was the process that we used to understand what's going on with R2 and R4 on this side of the circuit. I think that it would be a good exercise to do the same exact thing for the right side of the circuit. So just to be clear, clear this is like the, like the sense side, you can think of it that way, because it's uh, breaking down what you're getting from HV directly. And you're comparing that to the reference side, which is provided by a stable five volt signal um, over here. So this is your baseline, this is your reference, and you're comparing this value to this. So um, I didn't do that here. I made the circuit for you, you know, just to show you what, it would, what the other side would look like. But I encourage you to look at this design documentation and go through and figure out what, you know, just double check that everything matches up. So I sort of said that over here, basically. Um, Use something like ORCAD to design it, just to give yourself a little experience with P-SPICE. Um, go through and calculate it for the right side of the circuit. And why I mentioned before, why does the accuracy of V out from the divider we were talking about, why does the accuracy not matter? We went straight for the largest resistance values because we decided accuracy wasn't as important as current. Um, so I want you to think about that, confirm it. Cool. Uh, moving along, where are we in the circuit? We're after the op amp. So, quick review. The op amp takes these two inputs and determines if, it basically determines if um, the high voltage system, like the HV bus voltage, is over 60 volts or not. So, in order to check that out, uh, the, op the op amp output will correspond. So if it's high, then we're over 60 volts. If it's low, we're under 60 volts. Makes sense. Um, so then that output is going to a optocoupler, opto isolator. There we go. So that is what this IC6 is over here. So what this does is it acts kind of, it's, a, it's kind of like a fancy transistor. But you might think, hey, what's the point of this? Uh, first of all, real quick, this resistor over here looks like a current limiting resistor. I need to double check the data sheets to look at that properly, but it's 0.787K, very specific value. I thought they would have just gone with a 1K. Um, regardless, um, you've got your op amp output, which is the input into this. Um, the collector and the emitter. So when the op amp output is high, oh no 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 no. Um, yeah yeah, uh, you got to double check that resistor. Um, it's either current limiting or pull down. Probably both. Um, ah, okay. Don't quote me on that. I am also learning. Um, so what happens? This leg is connected to HV minus or ground. So what happens is when the output goes high from our op amp comparator, then you get a high signal. So you get five volts ish over here compared to ground. And it acts like it's, it acts like a transistor or a relay where you apply voltage across here. And these two terminals are connected together. So it'll connect your LV plus to your TSA, which so basically, when you're above 60 volts, then your output from this will be high, otherwise it'll be low. Now, real quick, you might be thinking, um, wait, that's the same thing that the op-amp comparator does. What the hell is this for? This extra intermediate step that doesn't seem to provide any new functions. Well, the way that this works is, from what I can see in the data sheet, it's kind of like a fancy, uh, fancy transistor where you got their anode and cathode over here, and you once you energize this, it, it's like a functionally like a tiny tiny little light and then you've got a photo 
something. Um, some sort of, uh, you know, it senses the light over here and then closes these two, these two things. What's the benefit of that? Isolation. It, as I mentioned before, you need to isolate your high and low voltage circuits. And this case is no exception on the same PCB. Um, in fact, let us look at here. Optocoupler. This is what we're looking at. It is an optocoupler. A phototransistor. Oh, that's the way to describe it. Yep, a phototransistor. So it's a light sensitive transistor. Um, so a light sensitive transistor probably implies that you're isolating this look like this this side from the output. So everything on the output is low voltage and all of this stuff before is high voltage. Remember, we're, we're, we're connecting high voltage directly to these resistors and all and into the voltage regulator. So this side of the circuit is high voltage. Um, and this opto, opto coupler helps us isolate this whole high voltage section from everything that follows, which is low voltage. Um, so that's the point of IC6. Now moving on, we've got the low voltage part of the circuit. Cool. What is IC3? Well, let's think about what, let's, let's split this up. There's a reason this, this whole thing is split up. So let's look at the top part of this. Now, what's on the end of it? Our green LED. What is our green LED used for? Our green LED is solid green when the low voltage system is on and HV is off. So if HV is off, I have a question for you. Will our, T, will our TSA signal connected here and here, will that be high or low? And I want you to pause, think about it, actually think about it. So, yeah. All right, now that you've thought about it, you're right. When we're above 60 volts, that TSA signal will be high. So if we want our red and green lights to be like opposites, what is the logical conclusion we come to there? You have one signal and you need to produce two outputs. How do you do that? I'm glad you asked. So, uh, what, let's look at IC3. What is this? It is an inverter. It's an IC... It's an IC inverter. I really didn't need to write that out. Um, I wanted to. So what's the point of this IC inverter? Well, it takes that signal. So when we're above 60 VDC, this signal is high. This takes it and inverts it and converts it into a low signal. So how, why, why do we care that's a, if that's a low signal? Let's look at IC4 over here. What is this? It's a transistor. So when your signal is high, you're, you're you know, high voltage or above 60 volts, IC3 inverts that, so this puts out a low signal. And the way that these work is you have a turn on voltage. So if you're below that turn on voltage, then these will be disconnected. You won't, the purpose of this transistor is that when you apply um, the, the, like a minimum voltage, then it connects your drain and source terminals. So what is that, what is that doing? So when you apply a high signal here, it grounds your green LED and turns it on. So when our tractor system is on, this is high, inverts it, the signal is low, so it's below whatever threshold voltage it needs. And so our LED remains ungrounded, and so our green LED is off when our high voltage system is on. Now, conversely, you'll see down here that when our high voltage is on, this signal is high, and we meet that minimum, you know, necessary voltage to turn on the transistor. And so these two are connected. Our red LED is grounded. And so it is on. So if you think about it in reverse, when the signal is low, the IC inverter will invert it to high and the circuits will sort of switch places that's wrong, they don't switch places, but you know, you get what I mean. Now you might be thinking, all right, but you said the red LED has to flash. Now I have to go in person to, um, I haven't been able to be, go in to confirm this, but after looking at the data sheet 
of the LED, it looks as though you can, it's, it's not just two wires, not just a plus and minus to turn it on. It's got some fancy stuff. It's got a controller inside. So by reading this section over here, we can see that if you connect the blue wire, if you ground this blue wire, then it'll have it, you know, you can, you can have it go through a pattern. So what we did was for the green LED, we left that wire out. Um, we probably chopped it or didn't connect it to, you know, connect it to ground. So that means that that would be green. That green LED would be a solid color. But what we probably did for this blue LED was we probably took this blue wire, wrapped it with the black, with the ground over here. Uh, we took the blue wire, wrapped it with the ground and connected both to this terminal over here. So that would cause us to have a flashing pattern, which would sit, uh, abide by the rules. Now, I think that does it. That concludes, um, I think that that's a pretty good overview. Um, so if I missed anything, let me know, but don't do, before you come yelling at me, go through this. Any technical details, if I got wrong, please let me know because I'm kind of a scatterbrain. There's a lot of things that I probably went over kind of briefly and a lot of things you probably don't need if you've taken a lot of these classes. But hopefully overall, I got most things right. Um, and I hope you understand how the T-cell circuit works.